here today to give a talk about Chinese architecture from stamps. All right, so I would, like to thank, I would like to take the opportunity to thank the Chinese Embassy and Phoenix for giving me this opportunity to share my, my knowledge and passion with you guys. So, next page. So what is your impression of Chinese architecture? What's the first image that comes to mind when we talk about Chinese architecture? Is it the Great Wall of China? What about Tiananmen Square? Or Forbidden City? And Heaven Temple? So the above four are the most commonly well-known Chinese architectures around the world, and I believe everyone's familiar with it. But the next part on the list might not be that familiar to you all, especially the, the non-Chinese guests here, right? So the Great Wild Goose Pagoda, Yes or no? Do you know it? No? Nope? Okay, that's good. <laughs> so it is located in Xi'an, China, which is an ancient city dating back to 221 BC, when the first emperor, Qin Shi Huang, who funded the Qin Dynasty. If you're not familiar with this building, I would like to invite you to take this opportunity and go to China and see the real China for yourself. Because like in the West, there's only so much you can see and you get to find out about China through Western media, such as the four previous images I've shown. Um, now I would like to explain to you all why the idea of home is so important to Chinese people. So this term, an ju le ye, so it, it means to live peacefully and enjoy working. But within the Chinese culture, if, if you look at the sequence of the word, Peace, peaceful home comes before happy career. So to enable you to have a happy career, you have to have a peaceful home first. And this idea um, traces back all the way to the Eastern Han Dynasty. Um, a famous academic at the time, Bai Gu, has put forward the idea. In accordance with the ancient system of the emperor, everyone has their purpose in a society. And as long as they do their job and stay within their grouping, the society is stable. So let's start with the main topic of this lecture. In this lecture, I'll be covering the following five points. So the origin of Chinese arch uh, civilian architecture. Um, also, I'll be covering four regions, for example, such as the Beijing region, River South region, Shanxi province, and Tibet. Now I'm going to move on to the modern development, how China's development has improved civilian life quality, um, urbanization trend, and also to finish off, just covering a little bit about opportunity for the UK. So as we all know, there's two important rivers in China, the Yangtze River and the Yellow River. And us Chinese believes that our civilization started by the river. And uh, on the map, as you can see, these four regions I'll be covering in the lecture today Beijing where is somewhere everyone's familiar with. Shanghai is the river south region. Shanxi, which is in the middle of China, may be considered as the old China. And Tibet, which is the furthest west. So civilian residence dwelling is the earliest form of architecture um, in the history of human being. China has thousands of years of history and vast territory. Many ethnic groups with different and unique customs, living, climate, and geographical conditions. This has resulted in the use of localized building materials, making it possible for very unique architecture styles scattered around, around the country. Um, so we're gonna start with Banpo village. So this society is traced back to around 5,000 BC, which is over uh, 7,000 years ago. And the excavation site is around 50,000 square meters. The Banpu people are very wise and has advanced te building technology, as we can tell from um, excavating, and the way they have built their houses. So just to touch on a little bit about feng shui, which might be quite interesting for some of you. So there is no infrastructure for water pipes or transportation technologies back in the days, and people have to live by the water for ease of access. And as you can see on this, Im this drawing here, the Banpu people um, has stationed on high ground by the river, and they even dug a moat for protection. So this is almost the common sense of basic feng shui, tracing back to 7,000 years ago. And now, 
I would like to show you a small clip of video showing how they have built their houses because they have the knowledge of using pillars and columns even from 7,000 years ago. This is actually a very advanced technology back in those days, 7,000 years ago. So the first step, what they did is that they would dig a hole about a, meters into the, a meter into the ground. And then they would slot in the columns to support the main structure. And one very interesting fact, if you look at, the, if you look at that little closing over there, that's actually a waterproof function. The Chinese from 7,000 years ago knew how to do waterproofing for their houses. So when it rains, the water doesn't get in. And then they covered in the rest of the structure with twigs and everything and tie it up. And then they have invented almost like ancient concrete, mixing hay and twigs together and mud and covering the entire surface, the roof of the building. So how did they make it stable? So what it did, they start a fire inside, so it will dry out the entire architecture form. So it becomes very hard, very solid, and it is big enough to support two grown-up adults to live inside. And this is one of the earliest forms of architecture discovered in China. So this is me. I was there just last month doing the research. And as you can see from the buildings behind, behind me, um, are the recreations based on what they discovered about Banpo village. <coughs> so the civilian dwelling selected for the Chinese civilian dwelling stamp collection issued in 1986 is very traditional and typical, showing the styles and characteristics of civilian architecture of different ethnics in different regions within the People's Republic of China. And we're going to start with Beijing. So I believe everyone knows this. Um, on the image is Si He Yuan. Um, si He Yuan is the, also known as Beijing Courtyard. Because of a collection of large number of rich traditional culture essence built up over many dynasties, Beijing Si He Yuan has feng shui deeply embedded into many varieties of this architecture form. So Si He Yuan has a long history in Chinese architecture, where Si it means four. He means um, the surrounding, which refers to the east, west, north, and south sides. Um, the four sides circles into a square, and due to its special layout, is compared to a box with a garden in the, uh, in, the, in the middle. So that's where the yuan comes in. The yuan means garden. And just a little bit more about feng shui. So in the Book of Change, it said that the sky is round and the ground is square. So from, from, from this term, you can actually tell Si He Yuan is, a, is one of maybe a perfect example of how Chinese people has built their architecture based on the traditions. Status is also reflected in the size of Si He Yuan. The more powerful a family is, the bigger the yard is. So on the screen, as you can see, it ranges from one courtyard to five courtyards, and sometimes you even get to see six courtyards. These Si Yuan's of all sizes form a larger grouping called Hutong, which, is, which forms a bigger picture of Beijing. Si Yuan only has one gate leading to a Hutong, so when the gate is closed, you're completely shut off from the rest of the society, and you get to enjoy a closed up tranquility and family life. So most existing Hutongs are relics of the Ming and the Qing dynasty, which ranges between 1368 to 1911. And these old cane chairs and wood carvings remind you of a strong classical tone of the old Beijing. <clears throat> right, next. So there are much more details, such as how big and decorative the gates are, and how detailed their gate screens are, and the materiality of the building details. And of course, the bigger and deeper your gate is, the more powerful the resident is. And currently, there are still many hutongs remaining under preservation, and you can visit and tour them. 
And at this point, I would like to talk about culture preservation, as many Westerners do question about the destruction of Hutong. Um, so because of modernization and higher population entering Beijing, there's a high demand for high density living. And the best solution is to get rid of some hutongs and replace them with high rises and maintain the rest. And luckily, I, have, I still have relatives living in Suhe Yuan's and the rest lives in high rise flats. And I've actually conducted a first hand research when I was in Beijing, um, where I went around and asked people from Beijing if they prefer to live in Suhe Yuan or flats. But obviously, this is putting aside economical factors because Suhe Yuan's now cost multi million pounds and flats are much cheaper. So the result is quite surprising because the majority said they wanted to live in flats because you have the flats are newer and with better facilities because old Suhe Yuan don't have toilets. You have to share the public toilets with the entire Hutong. So this is quite interesting. Right now, so we're moving on to River South region where it covers Jiangsu, Zhejiang province and the city of Shanghai. So the River South region is a very popular region for tourism and have a long, rich history. Um, the home to the multiple, most beautiful girls because we have many stories of emperors going to the River South region to find, 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 find wives for them. And also it's known as the Venice of the East. So for this chapter, rather than me talking, I'll, I'll, I'll be showing you a small clip of video of what River South is about. Okay, so that's an image of River South. So now we're going to talk about Shanghai. You know, if we talk about River South, we can't ignore Shanghai. Shanghai is the most populous city in China. It is one of the four direct controlled municipalities of China, with a population of more than 24 million as of 2014. It's a global financial center and the transportation hub with the world's busiest container port. And as shown on the stamp, you can tell that the architecture style features um, of the civilian dwellings in Shanghai has a very heavy European influence. This is due to the French concession between 1849 and 1943. So now talking about probably old China, Shanxi province. So Shanxi province may seem like the center of China, but the Chinese consider it as the north. And um, it's very dry and famous for its yellow col colored mud. The people of Shanxi eat mainly heavy flour-based foods such as many kind of bean, which is flat cakes and noodles, etc. Shanxi province is where the famous first emperor, Qin Shi Huang, has funded, has, has united China for the first time. And also the, with the unification, it came with the same writing system, measurements and currency. And also Shanxi is famous for the terracotta army so um, the British Museum has actually exhibited the Terracotta Army between September 20, 2007 and April 2008. And these soldiers are built by, um, on order of Qin Shi Huang, Emperor Qin, to guard his tomb after he passes away. So Northern Shanxi architecture is very interesting as they are the only kind of architecture in China where it is cool in the summer and warm in the winter. And of course, I'm talking about Yaodong, which means cave dwelling. Um, 
the province is covered by mountains, so villagers usually dig a hole in a mountain and live in them, and this is how Yadon came about. And over a long period of time, it has developed into the following form. Chong. <laughs> oh yes, sorry about the audio, I'm gonna talk over it because the microphone was covered up. I was actually in Yen An just a month ago to visit the cave dwellings. And interesting enough, this is actually a hotel. It's been converted into a hotel. And this region in Yen An used to be the commanding headquarter for Chairman Mao during the Civil War. And I stayed in that hotel that night for first hand research. So I'm outside the, ho the, the, the room at the moment. <laughs> And as you can see, um, this Yao Dong is different from the picture I've shown on the title page. This is actually made of stone. So this, the, this is almost the, the living room of the hotel. And you can see the, the Chinese style furniture, which is very interesting. And I found the most interesting part, the feature inside this Yao Dong hotel is the star the decoration, they try to keep this communist era feature inside the interior decoration. <coughs> so going into the bedroom, um, what I want you guys to focus on is the bed. So this bed in China is called Kang. It's the old, very, very old form of bed. And what it is is that the hole is for you to put firewood inside and burn for heat, so therefore the bed is warm and the entire room is warm. So there is two kinds of Yao Zhong. The original is mud, but then as we progress, people start making Yao Zhong out of stones. And the interesting fact is that the locals actually prefer to live in Yao Dongs other than flats. Because as when they were growing up, they lived in Yao Dong and they know that it is cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter. So once they start living in flats, they start complaining about how much electricity is because they have to turn on their air conditioning all the time. So this is quite interesting. And um, I have another video to show you guys where I've visited a modern Yao Dong which is made of stone and reinforced with concrete. And this, is, this has been adapted by the local villagers. <coughs> okay, sorry about the audio again. It's shot on my mobile phone. <laughs> so, so this I'm at a local villager's house, and they have uh, constructed these Yao Dongs for for the people in the city to come to the countryside for a weekend getaway. And these Yao Dongs are made out of stone with reinforced concrete on top to make sure it's um, safe. So going inside, once again, you can see that the bed is a fire bed and it's connected with the stove. So if you're cooking, that means your bed is warm and the entire room is warm. <coughs> And one interesting fact is that where I'm standing inside the video, all my surrounding is stone and reinforced concrete. But this section of Yao Dong is actually built in front of the old mud-based Yao Dong. So the villager has decided to make it interesting and build one in front of the other. And now I'll be taking you to look at what's behind the modern Yao Dong. So the villagers has left this opening for the guests to see what it was like back in the days. And as you can see, everything is made out of mud, handwork. And they have filled in a significant amount of um, the space below to keep it small enough, but uh, small enough so people can't stay in there, but big enough so you can use it as storage. <coughs> okay. So China is a very big country. Imagine the entire Europe as one country. 
and we have 56 different ethnic minority groups within the country. Our customs are very different, but we've managed, somehow managed to live together side by side peacefully for a long time. And the, the Han minority, the Han minority, which I would like to call them the majority, because the Han um, people forms up of 91.6% of the Chinese population, whereas the rest, the rest 55 minorities forms out of 106 million individuals and only accounts for 8.4% of the population. So talking about minorities, I would like to move on to Tibet. Because of the unique weather conditions in Tibet, Tibetan buildings are commonly built with stones and mud and heavily reinforced. So the local Chinese calls them diaofang. Diaofang means castle-like houses, as you can see from the image. And Tibetans are mainly based around Tibet, Qinghai, Gansu, and northern Sichuan province. Diaofang are usually made of three, between three to four floors, whereas the bottom floor is for cattle and storage, the middle floor is, for, is, is the living quarter, and the top floor is their praying rooms. Because Tibetan Buddhism in their hearts is very holy, so their praying room cannot be the same or lower than anything else. Therefore, the top floor is always reserved as praying rooms. Um, next. So on this image, as you can see, that the first floor and the ground floor and also the prayer room has been extended out to give extra living space within the house. And as I mentioned before, um, the Tibetans are based around a few different provinces rather than just Tibet itself. So the Sichuan Tibet region is an interesting area as the architecture style is very different from center, central Tibet. If you look at the house on, on my left, um, Sichuan Tibet region's house has these four corners, white features, unlike the central Tibet house, they don't have it. And interesting enough, these four corners, the white corners, represent the four holy mountains of the original Tibetan Buddhism. And it's quite interesting that the central Tibet haven't got it. Um, so now we're going to move on to talk about modern China. There's been dramatic changes in China and China, when China has entered fast-paced economic development. More cities are being built and the quality, life quality of people has been dramatically improved. Currently, China has 645 large cities, of which four of them are over 10 million people in population. 10 are between 5 to 10 million, 28 are 2 to 5 million, and 41 are between 1 to 2 million. A quarter of the world's over 500,000 population cities are in China, and that's how big China is. So talking about big cities, Beijing, the political center of China, media, culture industries, and IT industries. Shanghai, as everyone knows, is the financial center of China, and also heavy manufacture center, shipping center, and commercial center. And Guangdong, which is the light industry center, including cities such as Guangzhou, Shenzhen, Hong Kong, and the surrounding light cities, and also is known, commonly known as the world's factory, as the majority of consumer goods are produced there. So what is the future? Design firms all over the world now prioritize designs for China as it is a main client for the majority of design firms. So what, what does the future look like? Maybe something like this? Um, looking at the eastern and southern regions, developments, they're developing very fast in China, but the western regions and the northeastern region of China is developing very slow. So have a look at the bar chart. So I know you can't see the numbers, but you can see the scale of it. So clearly it shows that development in the northeastern region and the western region is not as good as the rest. So maybe for UK, companies should start looking at those regions. There are many policies being given out by the central government for those regions, so why not? Um, next. All right, so from, from figures shown in 2011, it shows that between 2001 and 2011, there have been on average of 20 million people moving from rural areas to cities every year. And prediction shows that by 2040, there'll be 14 million people moving to cities every year. Keeping in mind, China is a very large country. So here's what it looks like comparing to Europe. Very similar. Whereas European Union is all separate countries. We are one country, right? So, what does this mean for the UK? 
So I'll be talking about this within my industry, which is the architecture industry. So if you're doing business with China, you have to realize your strengths. So the British are very good at culture preservation. So looking at this image here, which everyone here is familiar with, you see the old and you see the new. You know, they, li they live side by side with each other and it's, ver it's very har har harmony. And um, for, the, for, for this one, so warehouse conversion, rather than knocking them down, you've converted them to house people. You know, it saves costs, carbon emissions, and it's very eco-friendly. So I believe that we, the Chinese, need to learn from the British on these areas. So what do you need to know to work in China or with Chinese companies? I think that you need to know basic feng shui. Improve your working efficiency. The Chinese works very fast on, on very short deadlines. And you need to know about Chinese culture. And I believe that's why we're here today. So just to explain feng shui, feng shui means wind and water. And one way to understand it is that wind is the matter above ground and water is the matter below ground. So above and below together forms the environment around us. So therefore, that's feng shui. It's very straightforward and needs to understand. So talking about where government buildings are built, old Chinese government buildings, all the way to Forbidden City, with the guidance of feng shui, it's built strictly with the guidance of feng shui. So companies didn't know this to, to make it easier for them to get planning jobs in China. And uh, I'm going to go, I'm going to briefly talk about the relationship of the elements. So as you can see on the chart, wood gives fire, fire gives um, earth, earth gives metal, and metal gives water. So, and also the shapes that represent what they are. So do pay extra attention on fire, this triangle. Because today is going to be a positive lecture. I won't mention the fact how the shard is made entirely out of triangle. Fire hazard. Anyways. So good examples include the London Eye, because London Eye is in the shape of a circle, which is metal, and metal gives water. And it's right by the water, so London Eye is built on very good feng shui. I don't know if it's accident or it's mistake, but this is a, you know, if it's an accident, this is a beautiful accident. So today, we talked about Chinese civilian architectures through stamps, and how culture exchange is important domestically and internationally. We know that in 1986, when the stamps were published, there were no emails, there were no cell phones. So sending letters is very important. Therefore, stamps are very important. And the Chinese people in China valued culture exchange through using this set of stamps, passing from one place to another. They ha this has made the Chinese people acknowledge and appreciate culture exchange, even though it, it is within the country. And uh, just to recap, here's a summary of the five chapters that we talked about today. The origin of Chinese architecture, which is Banpo village. Traditional civilian dwellings from stamps. China's modern development, urbanization, and also the opportunity for UK. To achieve great success, you need to meet the three conditions. The right time, the right place, and the right people. The Chinese philosopher Meng Zi believed out of the three conditions, people are the most important factor because people are the ones who make the changes. So today, I believe we are here today at the right time, in the right place, and with the right people. And let's, walk to, let's work together to, make, um, to help China, UK culture exchange more successful. And before I finish, I would like to share a short clip of Nanjing with you. Because today we talked about tradition and modern Chinese architecture. This video combines the old and new together perfectly. And it's produced by five young people in their early 20s, showing their love of their hometown. And it's spent over two years making this five minute video. And also, Nanjing is the hometown for Phoenix. So I hope you enjoy it. Nanking, the capital of Jiangsu province, a historical city that is full of vitality, a merge
marriage of the classics and modernity. It embodies a long story, no matter it is glorious or devastated. It reflects hundred years of history, the serendipity of a growing land, the perfect combination of the East and the West. From the ancient capital to the modern city, we are here to develop the origin of the modern China spirit. Time flies, flies like an arrow. The scar in the diaries of John Rabe has already become part of history. On behalf of our cultural memory, we began to write new stories for this land. This would be an epic for us.
hope everyone enjoyed that. And my name is Tabar Joe, and this is Architecture TYT. Thank you very much.